Your school where you can sit and watch this course. Your teacher who can explain it to you. A CD that contains this course. A computer to run the CD on. Electricity supply to run the computer. Your own ability to read and write. These are just some of the things that allow you to go through this course. All these are examples of things that you use to satisfy your need for learning. The things available in our environment that can be used to satisfy our needs are called resources. Provided they are technically feasible, financially viable, and culturally acceptable. Resources can be classified based on their origin, exhaustibility, ownership, and status of development. Resources can be living or non living. All resources that come from living things like forests, land, and sea animals. Insects and human beings are called biotic resources. Resources in the form of non living things like rocks, minerals, and metals are called abiotic resources. Resources can also be classified based on whether they can be regenerated or lost forever once used. Resources like solar and wind energy. Reversible chemical reactions and physical power which can be regenerated once used are called renewable resources. Fossil fuels like coal, natural oil and gas cannot be reproduced once used. The same applies to minerals that are used to extract metals. These are examples of non-renewable resources since they are lost forever once used. Resources can be owned by a person, a group of persons, a country or the entire world. Resources like private houses, shops, farms and plantations are owned by individual persons and are called individual resources. Resources like public parks, places of worship, schools and hospitals are open to all members of a community. These are examples of community-owned resources. All resources, whether biotic or abiotic, individual or community-owned, ultimately belong to the country. These include all the resources within the political boundaries of a country until 19.2 kilometers into the sea from its coast. There are still some parts of land like the icy continent Antarctica and the vast stretches of oceans which are not owned by any particular nation. Resources found in these parts of the world are called international resources and are managed by institutions related to the United Nations. Resources like mines where minerals have already been discovered and production is on to utilize their full capacity are called developed resources. Vast resources of natural gas and oil are known to exist under the sea near the Indian coast. However, not much of these resources have been utilized so far. 
resources that are known to exist but are not being fully utilized are called potential resources. Stock is a type of resource that cannot be used due to the unavailability of suitable technology. For example, hydrogen is present in the atmosphere as well as in water. Fusing two hydrogen atoms can create inexhaustible and clean energy. But no suitable technology exists to achieve this in a practical way. Hence, we can refer to hydrogen as stock. On the other hand, reserves are a resource which is not being utilized to its full capacity. But it can be used at any time in the future. For example, ethanol. Ethanol is an alcohol extracted from sugarcane and can be used as an alternative motor fuel. Resources that can be used today but are preserved to meet future requirements are called reserves. Let us quickly look at the classification of resources based on their origin, exhaustibility, ownership and status of development. Consider an example where all local people have equal access to forest resources. They use the resources wisely without damaging the environment and make sure that their future generations also have enough resources available to them. This is called sustainable development. What will happen if individuals start using resources indiscriminately to make a quick profit? This would lead to a rapid depletion of resources. This would also create an economic divide in the society as some persons will get richer than the others. This would also lead to environmental problems like pollution and land degradation and contribute to ecological problems like global warming and ozone layer depletion. The growing worldwide concern for sustainable development resulted in the first Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil in June 1992. At Rio de Janeiro, leaders from over 100 countries gathered to address the problems of environmental protection and sustainable socio-economic development. The leaders signed the Declaration on Global Climatic Change and Biological Diversity and approved the Global Forest Principles. At Rio, the leaders also adopted Agenda 21, which is a declaration to achieve global sustainable development in the 21st century. Agenda 21 aims to prevent environmental damage and fight poverty and diseases through global cooperation. It also aims to encourage local governments to form their own Agenda 21 based on local issues. Observe the items in this table. Can you imagine where the resources needed to arrange this simple breakfast came from? The wheat used to make the flour for the bread might have come from Punjab or Madhya Pradesh. The bread itself might have been baked in a factory in your city. The butter and the milk used to make it might have come from a city in Gujarat. The delicious jam and the fruits used to prepare it might have come from an orchard in Himachal Pradesh. The tea might have come from Assam, West Bengal, Kerala or Tamil Nadu. Even the steel used to make your plate 
might have come from the iron ore mined in Jharkhand or Chhattisgarh. The resources in our country are not distributed uniformly across all its regions. For example, some states in India are rich in food grains, while others are rich in minerals. The mere presence of resources is not enough for the development of a region. In India, Madhya Pradesh is rich in minerals, but lacks communication and transport facilities. So, what else do you think is required for economic growth besides the availability of resources? This is where resource planning comes in. It involves the identification and inventory of resources, planning with the appropriate technology, skilled human resources, setting up of suitable institutions for the implementation of resource development plans and equitable distribution of available resources for sustained economic development. Matching these with national development plans. India started with its resource planning efforts with the first five-year plan launched after independence. What are the different activities involved in resource planning in India? Resource planning involves identifying and estimating the resources available by surveying and mapping. Resource planning involves evolving technology, skilled personnel and institutions to implement resource development plans. Resource planning also involves continuously monitoring and guiding resource development plans to match the overall national development goals. The availability of resources is limited. Irresponsible and overuse of resources can lead to several social, economic and environmental problems. This is the reason why we must plan for the future and start conserving our resources at all levels. Whether it is water or oil, a drop saved today is a drop available for tomorrow. India is the seventh largest country in the world, with a geographical area of about 3.28 million square kilometers. This land is a valuable resource that supports our population, buildings, farmlands, and forests, and also provides us with rich mineral, water, and soil resources. India has widely different geographical features. From lofty mountains in the north to vast plains and plateaus in the central region. From deserts in the west to dense forests in the east and islands in the south besides a long coastline. The mountains allow perennial flow of rivers like the Ganges, the Brahmaputra and the Indus. They enhance tourism and ecological prospects too. A plateau is an elevated comparatively level expanse of land. Plateaus are rich reserves of minerals, fossil fuels and forests. Land in India can be divided into three main relief features. Around 30% of our land is occupied by mountains. 43% of it is plain and 27% is in the form of plateau.
depending on their use. Our land resources can be classified as forests, net zone area or total area under cultivation, fallow lands, other uncultivated land and land not available for cultivation. Fallow land can be further divided into current fallow, which is land not cultivated for one or less than one year, and other than current fallow, which is land that has remained uncultivated for one to five years. Uncultivated land, other than fallow land, is divided into permanent pastures, land under miscellaneous tree crops, and land left uncultivated for more than five years. This other than current fallow land is either of poor quality or cost too high to cultivate. Hence, sometimes it is cultivated once in two or three years. Land not available for cultivation is either barren wasteland like the salty plains of the run of Kutch. All land used for non-agricultural purposes, like building houses, roads, and factories. Here are two pie charts that show the land use pattern in India in 1960-61 to 61 and 2008-2009. to 2009. Let us compare the data and see how the land use pattern has changed from 1960-2009 to 2009 in India. Observe that there is no major change in the net zone area during the period. Note that the area under forests increased marginally from 1960 to 2009, but it is still way below the required 33% as planned in the National Forest Policy formulated in 1952. Permanent pastures and grazing grounds decreased during the period. This is not a good sign for thousands of people engaged in cattle rearing. The percentage of barren and wasteland decreased by almost half during the given period. However, this reclaimed land is used mainly for non-agricultural purposes. Current fallow and other than current fallow land also increased during this period. However, if these lands are included in the net sown area, since these lands are cultivated once or twice in two or three years, the percentage of net sown area goes up to 54%. Continuous and indiscriminate use of land resources without taking appropriate measures results in conversion of cultivable land into barren wasteland and exploitation of our land resources. This is called land degradation. We have about 130 million hectares of degraded land in India. To give you a sense of the size, it is roughly equal to one-third of the total area of our country. Out of this, 56% is water eroded area. 10% is wind eroded. 28% is forest degraded area. And 6% has saline and alkaline deposits. Natural agents like wind and water 
constantly keep eroding and degrading land. However, human activity has contributed to and increased the pace of this natural land degradation. Here are the main factors contributing to land degradation in India. Deforestation removes the green cover required to protect land from soil erosion by wind and water and thus contributes to land degradation. In some parts of India, Overgrazing by cattle has converted permanent pastures into barren land, leading to land degradation. Examples are the states of Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, Gujarat and Rajasthan. Indiscriminate deforestation and excavation done as part of mining activity and quarrying also causes land degradation. Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, Orissa and Madhya Pradesh have suffered deforestation due to mining. Over-irrigation of cultivated land in some parts of India leads to water logging. This increases the saline and alkaline levels in the soil, leading to land degradation. You find this in Punjab, Haryana and western Uttar Pradesh. Disposal of solid and liquid waste by industries on surrounding land or water bodies has also become a major cause of land degradation and water pollution. Industrial activities like grinding of limestone, calcite and soapstone which release dust retards water infiltration into the soil. This brings us to the question, what steps can be taken to control the problem of land degradation? The solution lies in taking steps for land conservation. Some steps for land conservation are afforestation, controlled grazing and mining activity, stabilization of sand dunes by growing thorny bushes, proper disposal of industrial effluents after treatment and continuous monitoring of soil conditions. Soil is formed over millions of years by weathering of rocks and minerals and also by natural agents like variation in temperature, climate, wind, glaciers and running water. The important factors that influence soil formation are relief, parent rock, vegetation and other life forms and most important of all, time. Chemical and organic changes also take place in the soil. Soil is a natural, abiotic, renewable resource. It contains inorganic and organic matter such as humus. Soil is an essential resource that supports a majority of plant and animal life on the earth. The layer of soil may be a few centimeters to several meters thick in different regions. Usually, when we say soil, we refer to the thin layer of the top soil or the fine upper layer of soil in a region.
based on their physical and chemical properties age texture and color soils in india can be classified as alluvial black soil red and yellow soil laterite arid and forest soil let us learn more about each of these types of soils the northern plains of india are made of fertile alluvial soils which extend to gujarat and rajasthan through a narrow corridor formed by the indus the ganga and the brahmaputra river systems alluvial soils are also found in the eastern coastal plains and deltas of the godavari the mahanadi the krishna and the kaveri alluvial soil is a mixture of sand silt and clay the new alluvial soils called khadar found in the gangetic plains have small particles and a fine texture the old alluvial soils called bangar found near the river valleys are coarser and contain more pieces of rocks called kankar in other words khadar is more fertile than the bangar The fertile alluvial soils are rich in potash, phosphoric acid, and lime, and are ideal for growing sugarcane, wheat, rice, pulses, and cereal crops. Due to the richness of soil, the regions of alluvial soils. are densely populated and the level of cultivation is high black soil also called regur is found in the deccan plateau spread over maharashtra saurashtra malwa madhya pradesh and chatisgarh Black soil is formed by the climatic conditions and weathering of volcanic rocks found in this region. Black soil is rich in calcium carbonate, potash, magnesium and lime. It also has good water retention properties due to the fine clay particles. However, it is poor in phosphorus, which is a very important nutrient in soil. This type of soil has to be immediately tilled after the first shower of monsoon to prevent it from getting sticky. It is ideally suited for the cultivation of cotton and is also called black cotton soil. Red and yellow soils are found in southern and eastern parts of Deccan Plateau, southern Gangetic Plains, along the Western Ghats, and some parts of Orissa and Chhattisgarh. The red color is due to the presence of iron in the rocks from which the soil was formed, and appears yellow when wet. The high iron content makes this type of soil good for cultivating various types of grams, groundnuts, and castor seeds. Laterite soils are found in Kerala, Karnataka, Madhya Pradesh. 
Tamil Nadu and parts of Orissa and Assam. All these areas experience high temperature and heavy rainfall. The soil develops by leaching due to heavy rains. Laterite soil is low in organic components and can be made cultivable with the use of adequate fertilizers and manures. It is good for cultivation of tea, coffee and cashew nuts. Arid means dry. True to its name, arid soil is found in western Rajasthan and parts of Kutch region in Gujarat that receive very little rainfall. It is reddish brown in color and has a sandy texture. Due to high temperatures and dry climate, arid soil is low in moisture and organic content and has high salt content. The salt content is so high that common salt is obtained by mere evaporation of the water. Forest soils are found in the mountainous regions of the Himalayas from Kashmir to Arunachal Pradesh. Most of these regions experience a cool climate with abundant rain and snowfall. The texture of forest soils varies from coarse grained on mountain slopes to loamy in river valleys. Forest soil in snow covered areas is often acidic with low humus content. However, Wheat, rice, sugarcane, and oil seeds are cultivated in forest soils of many parts in Jammu and Kashmir and Arunachal Pradesh. Soil is an essential natural resource that supports a majority of plant and animal life on the earth. It is a renewable resource. However, it takes hundreds and thousands of years for a thin layer of soil to form. Without vegetation cover, the soil that takes hundreds of years to form can be washed away in a few hours of heavy rain. The loss of soil cover due to natural agents like wind and running water is called soil erosion. Some human activities have increased the rate of soil erosion by natural agents like wind and running water. What human activities do you think are responsible for soil erosion? The roots of plants and trees keep the soil moist and hold the soil particles together. Humans destroy vegetation cover by deforestation, overgrazing, construction and mining activities. Without vegetation cover, soil becomes dry and loose and gets easily eroded. Defective farming methods like plowing up and down a slope increase the speed of water flowing down the slope. This increases the rate of soil erosion. Running water carves deep channels through clay soils. This is called gully erosion, which converts the land into bad land, making it unsuitable for cultivation. 
Such lands, also called ravines, are prominent in the Chambal Basin. When flowing water washes away the entire sheet of topsoil in a region, it is called sheet erosion. Wind erosion occurs generally in areas of little or no vegetation. It happens in places that receive scanty rainfall. For example, the formation of sand dunes in the deserts. The prevention of soil erosion is called soil conservation. Most methods of soil conservation aim to reduce the speed of running water and wind over land to reduce soil erosion. One way to conserve soil in mountainous regions is terrace farming. This involves cutting terraces along a slope. Other methods of preventing soil erosion include effective farming techniques. In plain areas, strip cropping can be used for soil conservation. In this method, strips of grass are allowed to stand between crops in large fields. These strips of grass reduce the force of wind and thus prevent soil erosion. This technique also prevents soil nutrients from depleting. Planting rows of trees along farmland also help break the force of wind and help in soil conservation. Such shelter belts of trees, when planted along sand dunes, help stabilize them and prevent the desert from extending into land available for cultivation.